so here in this talk, I wanted to talk about a problem that um, I was seeing in our mainframe community um, working on Linux on the mainframe, where we found some developers feeling somewhat isolated. So if you think of a Linux distribution, there's folks working on different components of everything. Um, sometimes people have like a tooling specialty or a language specialty or some subset of packages that they're focused on. Um, architectures are also part of that. So in our case, um, in the mainframe space, we have the architecture S390X. And we found that every time I talked to someone, so I, I work for IBM, and every time I talked to someone in one of these communities, they felt like they were the only one in the world who cared about it. <laughs> and it sort of first came up in the Debian community, um, because that's one I'm quite familiar with. And they reached out, and they're like, hey, our previous maintainer for this architecture has gone away. We need someone to help out with this. And the one guy who was kind of holding everything together was like, you know, again, I'm the only one who cares about this in the world. So the first thing we did was we created a working group um, within the Open Mainframe Project. Um, the Open Mainframe Project's part of the Linux Foundation. And so we said, okay, we have a Debian working group. So anyone interested in Debian can come to this working group. And it was a very quiet room. <laughs> so, um, so we kind of had to go back to the drawing board. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I started working at IBM about five years ago. Um, previous to that, I was doing Linux systems administration for about 15 years, um, starting in the early 2000s, you know, racking servers, installing Debian on them with little CDs. Um, and then I got quite involved with the Ubuntu community. Um, I wrote a book, I helped with a book on Ubuntu, and then I wrote a book on OpenStack when I got involved in the OpenStack community. Um, and I've been just generally around contributing to open source software projects for about 20 years. Um, so when I joined IBM, I joined as a developer advocate because they wanted me to talk to people like myself who were using Linux but were not familiar with the platform. But after a couple of years, I'm like, actually, we have a bigger problem, <laughs> and that is places like Debian where the maintainers feel isolated or the community feels like they're not supported. Um, so we founded the open source program office for IBM Z um, in our division last year. So I mentioned I wrote a book on OpenStack, which brings me to our first little story. So I'm going to take us back in time. Um, so I worked for HP on the OpenStack infrastructure team from 2013 to 2016. And in that role, um, we actually built the infrastructure that the OpenStack project ran on. So all the testing frameworks, um, the code review system, pretty much all the wikis and everything, all the bots for the project, we ran all of that stuff. And we did it all as open source. So our infrastructure as code, it was like all checked into the same repositories that we were maintaining. Um, and, you know, aside from like passwords and stuff, pretty much everything was in public. And I was like, this is really cool. Like, not only am I working on infrastructure, which I love working on anyway, I'm working on open source infrastructure. Um, and the reason this, this came up in the context of this talk um, was that we had interesting problems securing that environment. Um, so, you know, we were kind of doing new things with the tooling we're using. Like every time we talk to the Jenkins folks, they're like, you're not supposed to be running it like way out there in public like that. And same kind of with Garrett. <laughs> um, and so we'd, we'd run into interesting security bugs. And ultimately we, f ultimately we felt very isolated. Like we're like, we're the only ones out there who care about these problems of running an open source infrastructure. And I actually didn't make this connection until after I started writing this talk. <laughs> that I, I, I also felt this sort of isolation in, in one of my past roles. Um, but it turns out we were not alone. So what we did in order to address this feeling of isolation is I got together with some other folks I was working with on the project, and we created opensourceinfra.org, which was just, it's just hope, hosted on a VPS that I still run. Um, and what we did is we collected other open source projects that were also running their infrastructure in public. And so we now have a whole list. If you go to this website, it's like a list of like, there's probably 30 projects on there. And then we started collaborating with them. Like we had a mailing list. Um, we did a couple of in-person meetings. This one was at scale several years ago. 
and um, even our website is, is, on, is on GitLab. Um, but we kind of just built this community that didn't exist before of people who cared about the same things. And so, bringing you back to today, um, it turns out this is kind of a thing I do in my career. I work on something somewhat niche, and then I try to go find my people so that we don't feel so alone. So if you don't, I don't know if anyone's familiar with mainframes in here. I think Joe knows about mainframes. <laughs> Couple. Um, but the problem space here is, I mentioned it's a different architecture. So it's not x86. It is the, pretty much the last bastion of big Endian architecture that's out there now. Um, and so it's, it's, it's highly specialized hardware. Um, and in general, it's, you require some special expertise to know how to use it. Um, so you have to understand a little bit about the technical architecture of it. Um, there's restraints with regard to access to the hardware. Um, so my team, we give out VMs, Linux VMs on, on mainframes for open source communities, but that's only really a small subset of what needs to be interacted with when you're testing these. So it does the bulk of the job, um, but ultimately you need to test other things like peripherals and ways it's, it's connecting to other parts of the network. And the other thing that's really important is you have to have a deep understanding of the community that you're working with and really your clients and users and governments and whoever is using the platform. Because one of the things that the maintainers on the Linux distributions have to do is decide what packages are important to keep in the distribution. So if we're going to think, I'm just going to throw out there, like, you know, you have like the GIMP software, right? That's like paint software, it's artist software. Is anyone going to run that on a mainframe? I mean, maybe, but I've never seen it. <laughs> and so if that breaks somewhere in the build system, we have to make a decision. Are we going to keep that in, or are we going to try to fix it? Are we going to try to reach out the developers? And that sort of takes a lot of work. <laughs> um, and, but that's what the distribution maintainer has to decide. Like, are we going to keep building this for this, or are we just going to kick it out? Um, so that specialized expertise comes up a lot. And this is kind of where the isolation starts. So there's maybe one or two people working on the architecture on an open source, on a, on a Linux distribution. And they get bombarded by these sorts of questions and comments all the time. So first of all, someone sees S390X coming up in their binaries, and they're like, uh, what is that even? <laughs> like, we're building for all these random architectures. And I just saw an issue on GitHub the other day. They're like, it's 2024. Why do we care about this thing that I've never heard of? And I'm like, oh, <laughs> well, I've heard of it. Lots of people have heard of it. Um, or they just say, you know, what, what is a mainframe, more basically. Um, a lot will say no one uses this. And that partially stems from the fact that a lot of the folks running mainframes mm -hmm. will not just randomly download packages from the internet. <laughs> Um, usually they're either going through someone like IBM or a partner who already downloaded those packages and then puts them through a vetting procedure. Um, or they're getting them, um, they're you know, downloading it once and then deploying it to their entire fleet. And so the usage statistics don't quite show up the way projects expect. So I remember talking to one distribution and they're like, no one uses this. I have seen like three downloads in the past year. And I'm like, I know for a fact <laughs> that there is a huge fleet of servers using this, so please keep support. But normally this comes down to the maintainer who's getting this, like no one's using this. Um, the one around holding up the release is one I see a lot um, around release time. Um, so I'm, I'm, I sit in a lot of channels for the Linux distributions, and I watch you know, the build failures and stuff, and I'll see the developers being like, hey, you know, so-and-so is responsible for this architecture, and the builds are failing, um, you're holding up the release, um, and that's kind of when the discussions, especially in the community maintained distributions like Debian and OpenSUSE, that's kind of when the discussion comes out, like why are we waiting for this um, architecture that we're not familiar with, it's holding up the release. And then the last one is really important, it's, feeling like you're the only one who can fix it if it breaks. Um, saying, like, 
I'm the only one in the room who knows about this architecture. Um, I can't go on vacation, <laughs> definitely not around release time, <laughs> because then they're going to kick the architecture out of my project entirely. So it becomes quite stressful when you're the only one who knows what's going on. Thankfully, you're not alone. <laughs> um, so after creating that Debian working group that kind of fell flat, um, I was introduced um, with a woman from the OpenSUSE project, um, Sarah, and she was like, I want to create an OpenSUSE working group. And I'm like, okay, wait, <laughs> how about we create a working group? And like, we, you know, noodled over this and we're thinking about it and we're like, actually, we don't need a Debian working group and an OpenSUSE working group. What we need is a Linux distributions working group. So it sort of started off with Sarah and I. So I was working on Debian. She was working on OpenSUSE. And then we knew people from these companies. I mean, since she works on OpenSUSE, she knew everyone at SUSE. Um, I was able to find some folks at Red Hat. Um, I think Sarah knew the people at Fedora as well. And then we pulled in some people from Ubuntu. And then in the past year or so, Alma Linux and Rocky Linux started joining um, our calls. So, and I didn't, okay. So the first thing we did was we got together in the first few meetings. So we have monthly meetings where we get together and just kind of, the first few were like, yay, I'm not alone. <laughs> and it was actually quite social and, and engaging from a perspective of, we weren't really getting work done in those first few meetings. We were just kind of sharing you know, horror stories and, and commiseration and just kind of getting to know each other, which was really cathartic for the community because we hadn't had that previously. I mean, we kind of maybe had side channel discussions or encountered each other in bug reports before, but it was the first time we actually got together um, and were trying to share things. So this is just a screenshot from one of our recent meetings. So we've got, I'm from IBM. Um, we have one woman um, who I work with now, she's working on Debian. Um, Vignesh, um, he's kind of an example of how we've extended our community. He works upstream on a different project called Red Panda, and he works on various projects. And he sends me emails periodically being like, there's S3 and IDX support in this new project. So he's awesome contributor, but not necessarily from a Linux distribution. Um, got folks from SUSE, Rocket Linux, and OpenSUSE at this particular meeting. Um, so what we can do at these meetings is we talk about specific issues that have arisen in the community and then how we're going to deal with them or how we have dealt with them. So my first example is, I think it was like right before a meeting one time, Sarah noticed a build failure. And the funny thing about this build failure was it's remote desktop XRDP client. So this is like a, a you know, graphical remote desktop client which is a little bit unusual for us to encounter because we run a lot of remote desktop servers on the mainframe. It was strange that this bug came up on the client and that we wanted to fix it. But in the discussions with the working group, we realized that in the mainframe space, since you cannot just connect a monitor to a mainframe, everything is done you know, over, over remote channels. People do a lot of like chaining of X servers um, to get to get their their things out. So some people actually were running um, XRDP clients on the mainframe. So we're like, oh, well, that's new. And so we're not going to kick this package out. And now collectively, through the knowledge of the working group, we were able to um, decide that this package is important for folks in our community. So all Sarah did was like build up, bring up this build log. And she's like, it's failing. Has anyone else seen this? And Dan from the, uh, so, so Ulrich from IBM, he first was like, okay, I think I kind of recognize this bug. And he went upstream and he just looked for the thing. He's like, okay, it was fixed in 2021, so this fix is probably out there. And then Dan from Fedora was like, actually, we have seen this exact same thing and we have a patch. And the patch was just changing one of the flags in their test case because something had changed upstream in the project. Um, and the interesting thing about this is like, Sarah is a brilliant engineer. Um, but she may not necessarily be familiar with this specific package because in a Linux distributions, there's tens of thousands of packages. Um, so she would have had to look at this build failure, become somewhat familiar with the software, have an understanding of what it was trying to do, and then dig up that flag out of like the you know dozen flags that this software um, 
fed into this to actually find out what that problem was. But Fedora had already fixed it. And so, ta-da, like in the course of like five minutes, we fixed a problem that was discovered in Fedora and was also coming up in OpenSUSE. Um, another one was with the, the D language. So there's a couple of, of compilers that support this, but there was a very specific tool chain that uh, Fedora was looking to support. And by having this working group and by having someone like Ulrich from IBM who works on the tools team, this wasn't really on his radar, but Dan sent an email to the mailing list. Ulrich's like, I'm on it. He added another person from his team and that was immediately being worked on. And now we have a fix out there. And so they're, the tool chain that they were looking to support is now working great. Another one, this one was fun. So I was on Mastodon and someone was like, we're dropping S390 support from Alpine Linux. And I'm like, oh no. <laughs> we use Alpine Linux for a lot of container stuff. And so like that, that was not, not great um, for us. So I saw the bug report come up you know, in, in the bug system. And I didn't chime in immediately because I, I didn't have any, any real sway there, but I did bring it up. Um, at our next meeting, and I was like, "Hey, anyone interested in helping out Alma Linux or uh, Alpine Linux?" And this is again where, where Ulrich's team jumped in, and they're like, "Actually, this is this is very important to us, so we're going to jump in here." Um, but out of this, we ended up giving a bunch of VMs to that community, um, so they could run more tests more quickly. And there's also like two or three more developers who jumped on the project because we kind of um, brought that out there and through the working group spread the word that we needed maintainers for this distribution. The other thing we've been able to do is get some shared tooling across the ecosystem. Um, so OpenQA is a project that was developed by the SUSE community, and it kind of gives um, a uh, a, a dashboard, and actually I can probably show you. Um, if I was on the Wi-Fi, which I am not. All right, I'm not gonna bother with that. Um, but it effectively shows you like the, the build failures across uh, various ones, and you can do it by architecture. So several of these projects are now showing the, the build tooling. Um, and the failures in the QA system by architecture. Um, so it was started, OpenSUSE was the first one to have it. And partially through the working group and the connections that the OpenSUSE project was able to make through that, um, it's now expanded. So Rocky Linux now has an open QA um, forum and Alma Linux now has one as well. And this consolidated tooling has further helped our, our teams sort of collaborate and be able to match bugs because it was it's one thing to sort of one off i mean we're we're working with 20 or 30,000 packages having a meeting once a month and a mailing list you know doing that one package at a time isn't always very efficient but through tooling like this we can help identify them more quickly and compare you know apples to apples and so Hooray, we're not alone anymore. <laughs> um, so through this, I've actually gotten to meet a lot of the folks in person. So uh, Sarah and I gave a talk at the Open Mainframe Summit um, a couple years ago. Um, I've been able to meet my contact at Rocky Linux, um, who we've given some VMs to, um, and also my, the folks at Alma Linux. Um, and the other thing it's, it's sort of enabled us to do better is also get access to like peripheral devices. So I remember there was one meeting we were at where SUSE did not have a specific device in their data center, um, but I think Canonical did, or maybe it was Red Hat, I don't remember, but we were able to take the test case from one distribution and run it on another um, Linux distribution's um, infrastructure because that's what they needed. Um, and then also having contacts with folks at IBM has helped them out quite a bit because previously, while those channels were somewhat open, it's like email someone and then email someone else, but now they're just like, they come to me or Uli and we can, we can get them connected really quickly to the resources that they need. So that may not have been super interesting because you're not on a mainframe and this doesn't solve your problem, right? <laughs> um, but the, the real solution here is, is finding your people, right? So when I started um, 
the one, the, the group that I put together with the OpenStack infrastructure project. I was just like an individual contributor. I was just a sysadmin. I wasn't even, I don't even think I was a core member of the team um, in the way the hierarchy goes. I was just one of the sysadmins on the team. Um, I didn't have any special status in the project. I knew where our repositories were. I knew how the infrastructure worked and I knew how to throw up a website and get a mailing list. <laughs> um, and so I just, I just kind of saw a need there. And at the time of starting the working group, I did not run a fancy open source program office within my organization. I was just a developer advocate who was working with the Debian community to try to get more support for the developers on that architecture. Um, and so I pretty much was just an IC. So in the case of the open infrastructure project, um, we kind of got together and we're like, all right, what do we need to make this work? So it would be nice to have a website where you can see all the projects um, that are, that are ha hosting open source infrastructures. And the really nice thing about that is we were able to see who's using Puppet and who's using Jenkins and who's using the various tooling. And then we could go directly to them um, just by looking at their documentation and that kind of made the connections there. So in that case, we really just needed a website and a mailing list and a Git repository that everyone could access. Um, in the case of the Open Mainframe Project Linux Distributions Working Group, um, you know, we, Sarah and I kind of knew that we wanted to host it with the Open Mainframe Project, but then we had to decide what resources we needed there. Um, and that was, that was a decision too. Um, if you're working in a rather niche technology, you may think about um, partnering with uh, a foundation or an organization, uh, maybe even a university, um, maybe someone um, related to the government if that's the space you're in. Um, but just figuring out like who you should ally to because what you wanna do is make sure that you are reaching the people you wanna reach. So through the Open Mainframe Project, we knew we had the right people in the room already who could help build our working group and make it a success. Um, because it wasn't just gonna be me out on social media being like, For everyone come together. <laughs> Um, and so we, we, in our case, we decided we wanted a mailing list, um, a wiki to put up things like meeting notes and project information. Um, and uh, we have a web forum now because even though we all love mailing lists, apparently some of the new contributors coming into our community want a web interface for interacting with the community. So we just launched that back in October. Um, and then, as like I said here, like come back to this periodically and that's what we did. So we're like, Someone came to our project and was like, I have really, I struggled to interact through the mailing list because no one uses email anymore. <laughs> um, so it was, it was someone's proposal to the group and said like, hey, I wanna, we should change how we communicate in some of these things. So just revisit that periodically to um, assess the needs of your project and bring outside feedback into that. Um, and then of course, in the case of the um, open source infrastructure. We just self-hosted because that was pretty easy. And then for the mailing list, we relied on some friends who, um, it's in the Fedora community, who were helpful. They were running mailing lists. And I was like, I don't want to run a mailing list. I hate email. <laughs> I mean, I love email. I do not love hosting email. Um, I did that for a long time and it's not very much fun. So once you have your group, or at least you're thinking of forming some sort of group, you got to share it out there. So. The first thing I'd say is like find an ally or two, someone in your community who wants to do this with you. Because if you are the one making all the decisions, um, you may not make the best ones, but having two or three other people to sort of launch the discussions with and find out what the needs are. And, and the way the, you know, the founding members are comfortable communicating, right? Like if having a monthly meeting is what makes sense, that's what you should go with. Um, but maybe having a different sort of like maybe just you know, chat that we just keep going is gonna make sense for your community because that's already where your community is. But I strongly recommend teaming up with like two or three other people in your little area um, before you make any decisions. And then once um, you make that decision, if you've teamed up with an existing organization like the Open Mainframe Project, reach out to the folks who run that project and say, okay, we wanna start this working group. How can you help us publicize this? So in our case, um, we did a blog post that announced it. Um, 
We have done subsequent blog posts, especially when a new distribution joins our group. So when Alma Linux joined the group, we did a big flashy announcement through their, their blog and we put it out there to the community. Um, we also directly reached out to our contacts at specific Linux distributions to invite them personally to the working group and say like, hey, like we really want a representative from Fedora to come to these meetings. We want someone from Red Hat coming to these meetings. And that like personal directly reaching out to folks and like scouring our contacts and finding what other distributions we wanted to um, invite was really key um, to getting everyone in the room. And I will say we had no problem getting people in the room. Um, time zones are difficult because <laughs> we're um, you know, based all over the world. Um, but everyone is really willing to work together, um, which is something I think people, you know, they talk about the distro wars. But in practice, I've kind of found that Linux distributions um, being competitors, that tends to be more with the business folks and the users. And the developers, we are happy to work together. Um, and we do it all the time. And this has always been true for Linux distributions. Um, and so it wasn't, it wasn't hard. I was like, oh, you know, cats and dogs coming together. I'm like, not at all. Like, we all have been really good friends out through, throughout all this. Um, we also did, Sarah and I did a podcast um, with, with the, the Open Mainframe project. Um, and then, you know, they help us out on social media and, and whatnot. Um, I'd say personally share it too, um, so on whatever social channels you're on um, to sort of get it out there. And then within your own community, so you know I was working in Debian, we let folks in, in my sphere in the Debian community know that this working group is going on just in case there was someone else who was interested in coming. So maybe someone from the release team is like, hey, this is great that you're doing this. We're coming up on a release. I want to bring a few issues directly to the working group. Um, just having more people in the room has been helpful. And so making sure your community knows that you're doing this thing. Um, you can find some unexpected allies. <laughs> um, because I definitely did. I, there was people who, you know, I felt very alone working on this. But it turns out I had all these people rooting for me, but I didn't, I didn't know <laughs> um, because they didn't want to take on the bulk of the work. But they're like, we're actually very supportive of this work um, and, and let us know if we can help. Uh, maybe you want to give a talk at, yeah. <laughs> about your working group at, a, at, a, at an event. Um, and just generally the, the tips I have for creating one of these sort of groups that you bring people together is just first, be welcoming to anyone who's interested in joining the working group. Um, our original mandate was Linux distributions, but we've expanded that somewhat just because people came by and were interested. And we're continuing to expand that to bring in more upstream projects, especially there's a couple where we often find bugs and we're already engaging with those projects, but sometimes we'll just invite them to our working group meetings or ask them to join the mailing list. Um, and they've been, they've been pretty happy about that. And so we're like, it's okay, you don't have to be a Linux distro. Just, anyone's welcome, just be welcoming. Another key to this is holding regularly scheduled meetings. Um, a lot of us are very busy, but if we know there's a spot on our calendar every single month where this meeting will happen, we're more likely to attend it and make sure we carve out the time for that. And I learned this the hard way because sometimes I move the meeting and then no one shows up or it's just me and Sarah. <laughs> and I know that people care about it. Oh, and time zone changes, like when the US and Europe are off, that, that's always tricky. I should probably peg our meeting times to like GMT or something. Um, but hold, hosting regular scheduled meetings is really important. Um, and I will say, like, if you host a regular scheduled meeting and then over time people don't show up, um, just personally going out to them being like, why? Like, I know you're busy. Like, is there a reason you're not coming to the meeting? Should we move it? And then you just kind of change the time. But make sure it's, it's regular. regular. Um, and then just in general, stay on top of your working group, like whether it's pull requests or whatever service requests may come into your working group or items, or like if someone mails them, sends a mail to the mailing list and it's just sitting there. Um, what I will do in our Linux distributions working group is I'll, I'll make note of that and then I'll bring it up at our next meeting. So that'll be like the top thing on our agenda. I'll be like, this came to the mailing list and no one responded. So let's talk about it or not talk about it, <laughs> but I just want to make sure that that is um, um, paid attention to so that, so that folks on the mailing list know that people are paying attention um, to what they're sending. Um, and then otherwise, just generally, like after the meeting, if the person who sent that mail to the mailing list was not at the meeting, we'll follow up on the mailing list to make sure that that response is happening there. 
Um, and again, just expanding upon your original mandate, if you found the working group is working well or there's others you want to invite to it, um, go ahead and do that. I mean, we're called the Linux Distributions Working Group, but we have more members there. Um, and I, I, I sort of think, like, maybe we should have called it something else, but every name I come up with is really terrible. <laughs> like, open source working group. Okay, in the open mainframe project, which is all about open source, we're not like open source project, no. Linux distribution's fine, but you know, it's, it's okay to extend your mandate. Just talk about it with the team and make sure everyone's good to invite more people. So, all right, I have left room for questions, so. <laughs> All right, so the question was about CI support and, and, or, or development support on, on someone who may want to build for this architecture. Um, it, is, it is somewhat related just because one of the things this working group does is, is make sure that everyone has the resources they need. Um, so in our case, what we would do, what we do with Linux distributions and projects um, is for someone will usually come to our working group and if they need resources. Um, and Ubuntu has a build server where you can build like Debian packages and Ubuntu packages, and that's a fully public service. Um, so those are available. OpenSUSE also has their open build service, uh, OBS, or OpenSUSE build service. Um, and that will automatically build packages for a bunch of different architectures, including this one. So just right there, like without even involving anyone beyond the working group, we have those two resources. Um, beyond that, there's a, a page on the Open Mainframe website, and I actually have little pieces of paper with a QR code on them, which lists a bunch of different CI services that support the architecture. So that's also something that we developed in collaboration with the Open Mainframe project, so projects are aware. So it's like resources, um, if, you, if you're using Jenkins, there's a build service. If you're using CircleCI, there's, host, there's self-hosted runners. Um, if you're using Travis CI, that's available as well, GitLab. Um, has self-hosted runners. Um, and additionally, we can give out VMs, so virtual machines running directly on the platform. So some of the developers who work on the distributions even, they're like, hey, we have this whole build infrastructure in our organization, but I just need to debug some very specific things. So we also give individual developers who are part of the working group, and in, in general in open source communities with people I know or have interacted with or show a genuine interest, we'll give them a VM that's specifically for their whatever development they want. So we have one member of the working group, and he works across probably like maybe a half dozen projects. So he hasn't set up CI on, on the VM, but he does do like lots of um, testing, just manual testing really on that. So, yeah, go ahead. Oh. I worked on this in the 90s, <laughs> and a fair amount of the use of the time was, since I could run the Linux VMIX, they're called the Linux time, on one L bar in my other IBM operating system on another L bar, we bounced back and forth. So I could take advantage of Yeah, so the question, yeah, yeah, so the, the question is around um, the usage patterns for, you know, Linux on Z and, and like the other operating systems that run on the platform and whether there's a lot of interaction between the two. And yes, that is, that is a huge part of, of where the companies find the value today, just same, same as back then. So they, they may find like the, their system of record in DB2 on, you know, integrated in their ZOS infrastructure, like that's where all their data lives, but now they're interacting with newer microservices and things that are running on the Linux side. And so those machines, it's nice to have them near each other and even on separate LPARs um, or on, an LPAR is a logical partition on a mainframe. <laughs> each LPAR kind of thinks it's its own computer, but there's a bunch of them on each mainframe. Um, so sometimes they're together, sometimes they're in different parts of the, um, 
the data center or in other parts of the world. But that is, that is, that is definitely a use case. Um, I don't want to get too into like mainframe geeky weeds here, but also like these machines are really cool and really fast and really stable. And so it's, there's a lot of really good like Linux only use cases. So IBM came out with a Linux only mainframe, actually launched at LinuxCon, I think in 2016-ish. So it's like only Linux um, on those ones. And in those cases, some folks are running Linux only workloads. And that's why it's so important that all these Linux distributions are supported on there. Um, and why having this working group is especially important to companies like IBM. Like we want everyone out there collaborating and making sure they run as, as, as effectively as they can. Plus a lot of the, the enterprise distributions start out at the level of the, the community driven ones. So a lot of the packages that come out of Fedora end up in enterprise Linux. Um, packages in Debian end up in Ubuntu. So making sure that those are healthy, vibrant communities is really important. Uh, blue shirt first. <laughs> no, it's a, what would you use a Linux mainframe for? Um, I mean, so generally mainframes are really good for data processing. And this goes back, you know, 60 years. Like the, the first like enterprises and companies that were using computers, they were using them because they had a lot of data and they needed data because that's the only one who needed a computer was someone working with data. And it, it, it's kind of funny because it, they're still relevant now because of that same thing. Like everyone is using data now. So the latest ones, like the latest, um, you know, the CPU on these things, they have like an AI accelerator built into it. So it can do really fast inferencing. So one of the big use cases we like to tell people about with regard to that, since we all want to put AI on everything now, <laughs> um, is that like, you know, you have a model that's trained and you throw it at this processor and it can do like fraud detection. It does like the an analysis of, you know, applies the models and does the inferencing and detects the fraud very fast. And so that's one of the things. The chips have very, very big caches on them, which allow them to do a lot of that data processing. And so if you want to buy one, IBM would come in and do an analysis of your workloads and give you a bunch of fancy charts <laughs> and explain like what makes sense to go on this platform. So, because there's hardware decisions made based on that. Yeah, so the question is takeaways for maintainers who are working on something um, that I guess may be somewhat niche, but they don't know where they can find other people having a similar problem. That's probably the hardest thing to solve. Um, and what, I, what I'd suggest in that case um, would be I'd, I'd start with like if there's issues or bug reports related to that specific thing, I'd start with that very small community. If there's anyone who's responding to that bug report, even if they just have the same problem, is start just like start your network there and sort of start going out. Um, also just searching for other bugs that may be similar. Like if there's a specific string you can search for that's having this specific problem, just search. You can search all of GitHub, it turns out. <laughs> um, I do it all the time. You have to parameterize your search so it doesn't explode and give you warnings. Um, but you can just start searching and then just reach out directly to people who are experiencing the same bug. And then you can slowly sort of build your network that way. Um, most people won't respond, it turns out, but um, you just keep trying and just kind of find your people that way. <laughs> Yeah, so the question was, uh, in, in, in government, um, if there's like a mainframe community or whatnot. So um, we, should, we should talk to Joe later, because he's been in this space a lot longer than me. Um, but there are, there are, I mean, so I, 
I built my career in distributed systems, so this is all very new to me. And I feel like I've unlocked like this secret community of computing that no one knew about except for Joe. Um, <laughs> like, there's like conferences, there's events, there's all over the world. Like, there's these mainframe events, and these people they they're very like in their world. Um, but there's there's tons of talent and expertise in there, and there's a lot of government organizations working in that space. Um, and again, like with the Open Mainframe Project, most of the projects are actually on a um, they're not on Linux. Um, it's actually very focused on a lot of the traditional tooling for mainframes. Um, so there's a lot of folks um, in, from, from there as well, and I think we can find you some contacts. So it'd be great. <laughs>